I'm super excited to talk to you all today about strategies to identify strong candidates to run for office. You should have a vivid sense of what their communities mean to them. You are so suited to do this work because they're going to need your expertise and support. And as a local leader in the community, you have a lot of power. Please, please, please recruit wonderful candidates. Your work is vitally important to your communities in general. So thank you so much for joining. So with that, I will hand it over to Candice. Thank you so much, Bridget. Hi, everyone. Um, as Bridget mentioned, I'm Candace Harris. I am originally from um, Alabama. However, I've lived in Chicago for the past 10 years, and it's really where I have learned how to work within democratic politics. I, for um, anyone, any Midwesterner, Chicago is an amazing place to work in politics. So I have, I'm a political organizer and a fundraiser. I've been working in democratic politics full time for over six years, but many more years before that as a volunteer and local leader. I always like to point that out because that um, experience and the experience that you all are bringing to this training is so important. Um, my experience ranges from field organizing to legislative advocacy, movement building, and grassroots campaign. Campaigns. I've worked on several statewide campaigns, including ballot referendums, and also consulted for several local campaigns here in Chicago. Currently, I work at an organization called Run for Something as their Midwestern um, pod director. So Run for Something is a partner of National Democratic Training Committee. And what we do is we work with first, second, and third time candidates age 40 and under. So we help to identify, recruit, and support those candidates. So to date, I've worked with over 300 300 individual candidates in campaigns, spending a lot of time on strengthening their fundraising field and comms plans, and honestly just going over strategies of how to run a strong voter-oriented grassroots campaign. Over the past three years, I've been at Run For Something. I've helped to identify and empower countless candidates to run for office and developed programming to diversify our recruitment pipeline and make sure our candidates represent the diversity of our communities and country. So needless to say, I'm super excited to talk to you all today about strategies to identify strong candidates to run for office. So the objectives for today's training are to learn effective methods for finding strong candidates to run for a political office. We're also going to talk about how to recognize common traits of strong candidates for political office. And we're also going to start talking about the un understanding the time frame to identify candidates to run for office. So we're going to cover all that today. And by the end, you should feel even more empowered to continue to do the great recruitment work that you all are doing in your communities. So before we get into our training, I um, we have a quick icebreaker. So we'd love for all of you to just drop um, what you think are qualities that are important to a potential candidate. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Danielle. Passion, that's a great one. Activism. Um, <laughs> I'm not lying on your resume. Yes, uh, that I will say that that is coming up a little bit more now that we've seen what's happened on the national level with that. But hopefully we don't have those issues in our communities. Um, story, compassion. Um, oh yeah, all of these things are great. Integrity, that's a really great one. And desire to serve, um, thank you. All of the things that y'all are mentioning are all really great qualities. And honestly, this could be a endless list. Um, and also these qualities sometimes are even particular to your community and to the office that they're um, you're recruiting to run folks in. But I think all of these right now definitely um, resonate with um, me and the work that I've done, but also probably resonate with a lot of the folks on the call who have been doing candidate recruitment work. So um, continue to drop those in if you haven't already, but we're going to go ahead and start jumping into our training. So let's start off with talking about why it is important to identify strong candidates. And the reason why we ask that icebreaker is because the qualities that you all are mentioning are things that make a candidate strong. And it's necessary to assess those things when we're recruiting. So there's three core reasons why you all in particular are the best suited folks in your communities to seek out strong candidates. So first, um, you know that sometimes candidates need a little bit of a push. And we're going to talk about how we can encourage candidates to run 
Um, I see this come up a lot because I work with um, young candidates, well, folks 40 and under, who a lot of times don't think that they're ready to run, but actually have the qualities that you all have mentioned that do make them a strong candidate. They just need a little bit of a push. So we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about that you all are so suited to do this work because they're going to need your expertise and support. I've already seen some folks mentioning the organizations that there are leaders in. Um, you all are doing that work in your community. You're, you know the voting base. You know what voters want. And you also have expertise on how to run political campaigns. And But most importantly, you're willing to support these candidates. So they need to know that. And you all are the strong people to do that. And as I mentioned, you all have an idea of what voters and more importantly, what members of your community are interested in. What are the issues that they're really looking for a candidate to come in and um, champion for them when they get elected? So let's talk more about this push. So many candidates, um, many of the best candidates are just like, what I like to put is just regular folks. They have jobs, um, they have families, they might even um, be students, um, either in college or community college. They're folks just like you and I. Um, and they're going to need a little bit of a nudge from local leaders and party and um, and local parties or friends, or even loved ones to run and make a chance. So a lot of people have this idea of what they think a candidate should look like. Um, a lot of times they, and it's, and it's really sad because we have to like break those things down because a lot of times people think you have to have money or you have to have a network of um, deep pocketed connections. I know for me working with young candidates, a lot of times they think that they need 20 years of experience doing, you know, Lord knows what, to be able to be an effective candidate. So although some of those things are important, they are not the things that we are focused on because it's not the true matter of what makes a candidate strong. Anyone can run for office with the right motivation and support. And that's why organizations like NDTC provide free trainings to progressive candidates so everybody can have the support to feel like they have the skills to step up and run. So it's important for you to tell potential candidates that it is not all about their credentials. We say this on our, if you've ever been on a call with Run For Something, we say this pretty clearly. We say, hey, look, it doesn't matter if you have a law degree or you just have a high school diploma. Those kind of credentials are not the things that we're looking for to make you a strong candidate. We just need to know that you have a relentless drive and passion for service and a clear vision for making a difference in your community. So those are the things that you also need to be saying to folks to give them that them that little push. And you also want them to know that they're running for offices, that they can address the issues that they care about. So candidates, again, will need your expertise and support. And I'm really going to focus on support because a lot of times when people step up to run for office, they might not have, a lot of times they've never done this before. If you're, you might be talking to first time candidates, um, especially they might not have even worked on a campaign before. So they need to know that they're not doing this alone because running for office and serving as an elected official impacts not only the candidate, but their families and their communities. Ensure them that you will provide them with support that they will ask for. And something that I always notice too, with especially with first-time candidates, sometimes they don't even know what to ask for. So just being there um, and letting them know that you're there to support them along the way, and also that your membership will be there to support them along the way. They'll be that y'all will be there to help them to talk to voters, to help them support their fundraising. Um, it's attitude is everything with candidates. So you want to make sure that they continue to have high morale while they're running. And a lot of times that comes particularly from the support that we will give them. And you want to, and I'm um, speaking to knowing what voters want. Um, you all are local leaders, so you have talked to voters, you have talked to elected officials, you know the issues that are on their minds, and so this will help you also be able to identify candidates who will be able to relate to those issues. So it'll help you look for candidates who will have a personal story that will re re resonate with community voters. The best candidates excite voters by telling a compelling story about what motivated them to run. 
a connection with a candidate motivates people to vote and volunteer. So a great example of this is maybe um, a potential candidate is a parent and a member of your organization, and they have spoken about their child being bullied in school. But they, but you all also know that a lot of families in this community are facing the same issue, but the school board and the principal have ignored their advocacy. So now you're encouraging them to run for school board to push for mandatory anti-bullying training for students and staff. That way they can help ensure that all students feel safe in the classroom. So that's an example of a standout candidate who's able to convince that story of self, which is their narrative overview of the experiences and challenges and triumphs that went into making them the right person to run and also making them the person they are today. And so when they're able to articulate those compelling reasons and those personal stories, it really resonates with the voter base. So I mentioned to you all that there would be a lot of interaction in this. I would love for you all to drop an example and answer this question um, of can you think of any candidates, local or national, who have compelling stories that have contributed to their success? If anybody has, okay. Oh, I'm glad you men mentioned Tammy Duckworth because we might be speaking about her later. Okay, all of these folks are great examples. Um, I, I see we have a lot of Illinois folks on the call. Wes Moore, definitely. And I, it's great that you all are um, putting these folks' names in the chat because you probably remember either seeing them on TV or having a canvasser come to their door or come to your door, or maybe even them coming to your door. And the story that they told and the background that they gave about what brought them to the point of running for office, and it really resonated with you. And that's why you're able to recall it so quickly. But also it's um, I always remind candidates that those stories and those interactions are what people are going to walk into the voting booth remembering. So it's really important to be focusing on that when you are thinking about um, your candidate recruitment. People should literally be able to sit down with you in a one-on-one -on -one and just talk to you about what the things they are passionate about and who they are. Um, they it, It's really as simple as that. And um, if you've done any candidate recruitment, you might have experienced it. But I know when I speak to candidates, I know um, I can think of some candidates I've worked with that run for something. Um, Justin Bibb, who's the mayor of Cleveland, I remember having an initial conversation with him before he started running. And he his personal story um, of growing up in Cleveland and why what he had been doing in his community like just struck me. And I don't even live in, live in Cleveland, but I was absolutely like, you are the person that we want to support. And now he's the new mayor of Cleveland. The right candidate can make all the difference, but how do you spot the ones who can truly make an impact? To help, we've linked our free prospective candidate worksheet in the description below. And with it, you'll lay out what issues are most important to your community, who locally is working to improve those issues, and how to build a support network for prospective candidates. So download our expert-created prospective candidate worksheet now to find your next strong candidate. Now back to the panel. Now, um, now we know why it's important to recruit strong candidates. Let's talk about the qualities that make them strong. And thank you all for all those great um, examples. We're going to actually um, maybe highlight a few of the ones that you all um, mentioned. So... Um, these are some of the qualities that NDC, NDTC knows coalesce together to make a strong candidate. So it's rare to find the perfect candidate in every way. So don't be focused on perfection. You want to be thinking of members of your community who might want to run for office Um Focusing on these six central things, but knowing that everybody is not going to have everything together. And actually, some of these things can also be things that you all can work with them on to help them, like especially a story. You can kind of help people um, learn how to articulate their story, right? But these are also some common traits that a lot of strong candidates sh um, share. So as mentioned before, candidates should have a compelling story of self. And sometimes that's an indication that someone either needs some support in developing that or might not be able to, might not be ready to run quite yet until they really kind of are comfortable speaking about that. Candidates um, who are standouts are also able to impart 
clear stories of us. So that's an understanding of the shared values and experiences that bind their communities together. And by telling that story of self and that story of us, you should be able to have a vivid sense of what their communities mean to them and why they are willing to step up and run for office. They have to want to make it to the finish line. So that desire to win is important. Your support will help will help them. It'll help them feel supported along the way. But they must be able to envision what it looks like to win and what the work is that they need to do that's necessary for them to win. You have to also have resilience. You probably have also heard the um, you probably have heard the campaign saying of like, Campaigns are a marathon and not a race. Um, I a lot of times say this to folks because, you know, there is a level of endurance that is needed in this. But also there are just going to be times where the candidate's going to fall behind or unexpected challenges are going to occur during the campaign. So helping them to um, to develop a sense of resilience and focus on the goal of winning Creating that attitude or them actually embodying that attitude is going to be really important for them to be a strong candidate because campaigns sometimes are long and sometimes they are difficult. Also, their values must align with the community. Now, that doesn't mean that they have to 100% agree with everything the voter base raises. That's why I love that we put value alignment. But there does need to be some common overarching values that connect them with the community. Um, And there we go, connection to the community. So I just look at this as like, hey, candidates should be involved and connected to their community before they run for office. We emphasize this a lot at Run For Something because, you know, with our name of, hey, run for something, a lot of times we have people step up and they're like, I'm ready to run. And the first question we ask is, well, you know, that story of self, but also what are you doing in the community right now? They should be able to talk to you about what their connections are to the community before they get ready to run. And also um, strong candidates have a new voice. Um, A strong candidate can be a welcome change in um, the pace of elections, but they also need to be confident in their message and willing to speak up when they need to. So let's talk more about that compelling story. When thinking of people to recruit, ask them, you know, what is your story of self? What brings you here today? If they can tell that compelling story, then they have one of the key attributes of a great candidate. And they should be able to know their why and be able to articulate that. So they should have a compelling background and a and a reason to run. And I'm not afraid to push on candidates a little bit because sometimes their reason to run might be dealing with the incumbent and what the incumbent hasn't done for the community, but it should also be personal to them. So as you're recruiting folks, don't be afraid to challenge people on their reason because they might be a great candidate, but again, they might just need to think a little bit more deeply and what is their why for doing this. And it's really important for them to know that why, because that's going to be a part of that resilience part. Candidates are going to be asking themselves why every day. People are going to be walking up to them, asking them why they're running every day. So it's really, really important that they really resonate with that why. So an example of that why, and also a little bit of that what that they might be doing, like how are they already involved with the community? So here's a quick example. So maybe this candidate is a renter in an area where longtime lower income residents are being forced out by developers and gentrification. They've organized community meetings, addressed the city council, and led protests all to no avail. So now you are encouraging them to step up and run against the developer-backed incumbent to give a voice back to the people. Now, that's an important example of what they're doing and why they're running and also how it resonates with them. This is some things that they should be prepared to talk about, but it's also something that's going to resonate with the voters. And it shows that they're already invested in finding solutions in their community, and they'll continue to do that when they're elected. So a few of you mentioned Tammy Duckworth of being a great example of a compelling candidate and who has a compelling story of self. So just a few things um, for those who are not as familiar with Senator Tammy Duckworth here from the great state of Illinois. 
Um, besides being a combat veteran of the Iraq war, um, Senator Duckworth is also the first Thai American elected to Thai American woman elected to Congress and the first woman with a disability elected to Congress. So all of those parts of her narrative, as well as, you know, losing her first race in 2006 and coming back to run again and win the next time, but also being representative of, of a community that really should have a voice in our United States Congress. All of those things really compel Senator Tammy Duckworth, but also are the things that resonate with voters. I know I um, canvassed for um, her when we were, when I was working on the candidate, um, the coordinated candidate campaign back in 2016. And I remember um, talking to voters and these are the things that resonated with them. And it's the reason why she won. So Let's talk about a candidate's desire to win. Now, when recruiting a candidate, it's essential to know that they've got what it takes to win. Because even in a long shot race, a desire to win helps candidates make strategic decisions and build long-term democratic power. It's also necessary that they understand the time commitment involved and that they have buy-ins from their family, friends, and community of support. Now, as we said before, run, running for office is hard and it's going to require a tremendous amount of time and mental energy. It can also be a strain on that candidate's personal and professional relationships. So before encouraging a candidate to take the plunge, I encourage you to just be honest with them. Have candid, candid conversations about the time commitment involved and the fundraising expectations. And then also make sure that they discuss that time commitment and those professional commitments with their family. Um, a candidate cannot function at 100% without community and family buy-in. I encourage people to be very honest about that. And at Run For Something, we bring this up in our initial calls. Um, we want folks to know that it's going to take time and that they're also going to need to commit to talking to voters and raising money. It's also important for you as a local leader to address their concerns or hesitation seriously. Now, the reason I say this is because I've seen a lot of candidate recruitment be done by a lot of different organizations, and our political climate is very interesting, to say the least, right now, and it looks a little bit different in every community. So why I say um, you need to address their concerns or hesitation seriously is because you need to establish a sense of trust with this candidate as well, because you are going to be a part of that support. So for instance, a candidate might be concerned about the possibility of a local right-wing group targeting them and their family. Although this may not have been an issue in your community and in this race in the, pa in the past, they are aware of this growing of growing organizations that might be active in the communities, or they're aware that this is just happening. And they're maybe fearful that when they step up to run, this might ignite a level of backlash. Even if you feel like this is not a primary concern, please be sure not to dismiss it. Um, and I say that from hearing from candidates, feeling like maybe their local leaders have not taken some concerns seriously. It's we are that community of support um, at run for something. A lot of times I'm part of that community of support. So when people come with hesitations or concerns, because this is probably going to come up again later in their campaign, the better way to address that is to talk about how your organization can be a part of that support system and even maybe talk to them about, hey, let's. I know that's a serious concern, but let's talk about how we can create a response plan if that is to happen, or even how we can help you be prepared so you don't, so if something like that does happen, you don't feel like you're in it alone. Um, taking a candidate's concern seriously is really important, especially when you're talking to candidates of color and women. Um, just to be honest, it is harder for us to run in some communities and we're targeted in different ways. And it's really important to just address those because it creates a level of trust and it establishes that the candidate knows that you're really on their team. So let's talk about another wonderful example of a candidate who had a great desire to win. So this is Katie Porter, who is a representative from California's 45th district. Um, she's a single mom. While she was a single mom providing for three children, she quit her job to commit to running for office. Now, when the state Democratic Party endorsed another candidate during her first run by one vote, 
she didn't let that deter her. She still stepped up to run and win the race. Sometimes, especially even if you are not the candidate, the chosen candidate, and a lot of times this happens in bluer districts where there's just a really large array of candidates running in a primary, um, there might be a candidate that you're working with who you know is the right candidate to run, but they're going to face a little, um, there might just be some challenges in that. So being able to assess that they are willing to commit and they sh- really want to do whatever is reasonable within their, um, because everybody's not going to be able to quit their job, but there might be some things that they are willing to do to be able to put the time in to run. So they just need to be in it to win it. And I think that's the simplest way to put it. So let's talk a little bit more also about resilience. Now, when considering someone to recruit, gauge their resilience in their fire. When brainstorming potential candidates with other local leaders, make sure to address this point. Candidates have to understand that running for office is is rarely easy and entering a race, knowing that there will be bumps along the way and that their team needs to um, be prepared to overcome them is the best attitude for a candidate. Now, um, Bridget is going to drop a quick link because we actually have a little bit more support around this. If you know a prospective candidate who's getting ready to run, you can direct them to this first course call. Um, so you think you want to run and it talks a little bit more about um, how to develop resilience. Um, so also from my experience, too, when having these initial conversations with candidates, Outside of just being honest, because you don't necessarily, I know ne- I never want to scare a candidate, but I also just ask them, you know, I just break it down. Sometimes I break down the time commitment. Um, I also, you know, might talk to them about challenges that they have overcome in their community or challenges that they've overcome in their personal narrative. Those are different ways that you can start assessing if you have a candidate that has has to be a, the behavior to be able to um, thrive under pressure. But also as a local leader, just being able to let them know that they're not going to be there alone. A lot of times people feel like when times get tough, that they're going to have to deal with it by themselves. So on top of just knowing that there are people that are willing to put in the work and have been able to show resilience in past situations, letting them know that you're going to be there. Because I think that makes a world of difference with how people might be assessing their run. So here's an example of a candidate with resi- with resilience. So Congresswoman Cori Bush was knocked down several times before winning her race in Missouri's first congressional district in 2020. She became a standout grassroots organizer during the 2014 Ferguson um, unrest. She ran for Senate in 2016 and lost that primary, then ran for Missouri's first congressional district and lost that primary. But she didn't give up because she knew that she had a community behind her and she knew that she was the person and the voice that needed to be there to be able to take her community's needs to Washington. And she didn't give up. She ran again in 2020 and that was her year. Um, A great example of that too is um, at Run For Something. We used to just work with first and second time candidates, but um, while I was there, our team uh, um, decided that we're gonna start working with third time candidates because perfect example with Corey Bush, in a lot of areas, especially in tougher areas where a Democrat might not have been elected in a while or where they're really going to have to be building an organization from the ground up, um, they got to run a few times and they still need that help. So um, knowing that candidates have resilience because every time the first run is not going to be the one where they win, but being able to know that they might step up to run again or that they might be able to use that energy to be able to become a local leader after that run. Whatever that looks like, resilience is needed, and a few runs sometimes is needed as well. Now, value alignment. So we can all think of a national figure or a politician who failed to live up to our high standards of behavior. Again, there are no perfect candidates, but in the recruitment process, ask, Will rank and file Democrats be excited to support this person? 
And the answer to this question might make the decision easier. The candidate is going to have to rely on the Democratic base voters, regardless of the composition of the district. And as a local leader in the community, you have a lot of power. So in some ways, you might be their first line of defense. You also are a vetter of sorts who can tap the moral and upstanding individuals you know, whose values align with the democratic vision in the community and elevate them to run. Um, An example of that as well is um, whenever candidates apply to run for something, We always reach out to folks like yourselves, county chairs, um, local Democratic leaders, and we literally ask them, hey, do you know this candidate and do you know if their values are in alignment with what you think is necessary for a candidate to run in this community? Because y'all's input is so important and you really are a vetter. You are a validator of that candidate being a strong candidate and one that an organization like ours or any other organization might want to invest their time and interest in. So seeking advice from other local leaders. Um, This basic level of information can yield great results. It also may raise red flags about a potential candidate. Um, Someone mentioned in the chat earlier, people lying on their resume. Uh, It just happens sometimes. It can also unearth just the issues with the value alignments a lot of times is what comes up to people might say that they're for something but there's something in their past or some interaction that they've had that doesn't speak to that it'll also strengthen your network to be able to reach out to other people to get information about this candidate and it'll create better partnerships along the road for you to be able to do recruitment with in the future so as i mentioned We do this at Run For Something, and it's for those reasons. We want to create partnerships with people in the community, but we also feel like local leaders like yourselves are the best validators of these candidates, and you're able to let us know if they are candidates that we should be supporting. And also sometimes it's able to let us know, hey, this is a candidate that you should be supporting, and we want you to be connected with them as well. So I know a few of you mentioned Barack Obama or President Barack Obama earlier as a candidate who is one that um, resonates as a strong candidate to you. So Obama mania is a term coined around the electric environment surrounding President Obama's campaign, but it didn't just come out of the blue. Um, He was a poster child of what folks in the Democratic Party were looking for so much at that time. Not only was he just a person who um, told he had an amazing, compelling personal narratives. Um, I actually have sent candidates videos of speeches from President Obama to give them an example of what a person of narrative, a personal narrative and a compelling story sounds like. But he was also heavily invested in his community long before running. His campaign revolutionized democratic politics by bringing in diverse campaign staff, mobilizing significant numbers of people of color and young voters to volunteer and creating the new snow, the snowflake model of organizing. So we use him um, in Bridget just dropped an example of what we mean by that relational organizing and that snowflake model. Um, This is an example of a campaign that reached out to local leaders and local community members to be able to build a strong, vibrant, energetic campaign that was based in the values of the community. And so also connection to the community. This is another important trait for a candidate because campaigns are about winning, but also changes to a community cannot be enacted if the candidate is not connected to the community in a way that they are informed by what the community needs and what they need to champion when they're elected. So if a popular local activist or well-respected clergy member wants to run and they've reached out to you or you've identified them as a strong candidate, there's a good chance that they stand a better chance of winning simply because they may they have name recognition. It's because they're doing the work. People know them. People have seen them show up, show up in meetings. People have seen them do the work that the community needs. So this is something that's really important. Again, candidates should be doing something before they... Um, are run before they run. And so um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, better known as AOC, is a great example of that. Deep candidates are connected 
to their communities, either formally or informally. So um, she was nominated for a brand new Congress, which was a goal to recruit progressives who weren't wealthy, well-connected folks to represent their communities in a more community-minded, diverse way. And she was also really connected. People knew her. And it was a reason why her campaign was so successful. And last, um, one of the most important things and traits of of a strong candidate is a new voice. Popular candidates are going to be offering something new, something we haven't heard before. Um, And they're going to be diversifying the slate of representation. It's sometimes good to just have a new perspective. And a lot of times we do see that when we see the new generation, you know, Gen Zers, millennials stepping up to run. A good candidate needs to check off, you know, a lot of boxes. They need to have leadership potential, but it's also important that they might be bringing a different perspective to the race. And another great example of this um, is Illinois Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. She ran against an incumbent um, in a really, really tough seat. And she boldly defended the Affordable Care Act, not only for herself as someone as a pre-existing condition, and she's also a registered nurse, but also for everyone in her district. So um, she was someone who was willing to step up in, in a tough district to win, and she brought a new voice and a new perspective to the community. So um, just quick discussion question. And Bridget, also, I feel like we've had a few questions pop up in the chat, so um we well, have I'll, yeah <laughs> I will take this pause to address those but also if you all would I'd love for you all to just drop some answers to this discussion question how does a potential candidate demonstrate their passion they're passionate about bringing change to the community and living um democratic ideals Great. so yeah um Bridget if you could yeah. just um read out if you want to um I guess you can start with some of the questions Right. Uh, Is there a difference between what makes a good candidate versus what makes a good office holder? Hmm, That's actually a really good question. Um, I don't think there's a huge difference, especially when it comes to those core values that I just mentioned, because I think those core values are also important when people are in office, because a lot of times that resilience translates to being in office. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think there's really a big difference, but I do think for a candidate that desire to win is everything because the campaign is just tough. But to be honest, I don't think there's a huge difference, especially from the framework that we've given because I think that if people learn how to be good candidates, they can be wonderful elected leaders as well. Um, because all the things that they're doing in the campaign, especially when it comes to resonating and listening to the desires of the community and um, having that passionate you know, aspect of wanting to make change in their community, I think that translates pretty well. Great answer. Um, There were a couple of questions about um, what happens if you're in a really red area where Dems don't usually win. So it's a little bit harder to recruit candidates because they know that the odds are long, um, you know, in like county office or something. So what uh, what advice do you have to convince candidates? um, What advice can you tell uh, give to local leaders to tell candidates um, why there are other benefits of running outside of winning? Okay, so I think that's why you have to focus so much on the work that the potential candidate is doing and the passion that they have around the issues that they want to run and the platform that they want to run on and the position that they're running for in particular. The examples that I gave about a candidate being passionate about housing issues and now they're running for city council, it's really important to when you're talking to candidates to make sure that they are aligned with those values and also are passionate about it, because especially in tough areas, that's going to be what's driving them. Um, Because winning is not always the goal. Again, sometimes it takes, especially in districts you're trying to flip, it might take a few runs um, for people to be able to make a difference in that community. So if a candidate is really rooted in their values, that'll that can make it an easier sell. But I think another important thing is that support. 
you have to let them know that you will be supporting them because it is actually, it, it, you all know, it's very tough to run in um, red districts. Um, the support just looks much differently than it looks like in other areas. So just knowing that you will be there to help them make those calls, to help them figure out their fundraising plan, to connect them to resources like NDTC so they can learn how to do all the things that they need to do to be a strong candidate, that can be helpful when you're trying to convince folks to run in tough areas. But also that part that I mentioned about just being like listening to people's hesitations and responding to them rather than saying, oh, no, don't worry about that, especially in red areas. No, respond to their hesitations and let them know that you're not just trying to get them to run to fill a spot on the ballot. You you want them to run because you really believe in them and you care about them. So just being genuine about that can help people trust you and maybe feel a little bit more comfortable about running in a difficult area. Excellent. I think I have time for one more. Yes. Um, and the last one, there were a couple of questions. I think um, the George Santos of it all, <laughs> uh, how do you vet a person? What are the best tools for vetting candidates, making sure they are who they say they are, that they have the degrees that they say they have? Do you have any suggestions for that? So first I'm going to, um, I don't know if NDTC has any training around this, but if there, um, there, if there are, like, it would be great if you could drop that link. There, this actually is a little, I'm not going to say more difficult because there actually is a process to um, vetting. Um, what I'll say is the short answer is um, when it comes to self-vetting or vetting, first definitely take some time to actually just do some preliminary research on folks. Um, I actually think I'm going to find a video. We have a video um, on Run for Something's resources. I'm going to try to find before the end of the training to drop about how to start doing like some vet oppositional research. But I could just say it could be as simple as asking questions. I feel like with the George Santos uh, situation, which is so wild, that there were just some things that really didn't add up from the beginning. And if you have a suspicion that some things are not adding up about a candidate, um, definitely feel free to look into those. Also, I see people mentioning background checks. The only reason I wasn't going into that is because those things do cost money. I do think it is worth, especially if you're running someone for a high profile race to invest in either um, contracting with a firm that does oppositional research and literally just saying, hey, can you look into this candidate? There's a lot of different things that people can look at. I can just speak to the things we look at at Run for Something. We do a social media search. We go through all their social media. Um, we also run a preliminary background check. And also you all should have access to the van. <laughs> you wouldn't be, you'd be surprised of how many people try to run as a Democrat or say they're a Democrat and they might actually not be a Democrat, which is also wild. We have people reach out to us for endorsements that aren't Democrats. Um, some of those things you have those tools to look into, but I don't want to go too deeply into that because it actually can be, it is a whole process, but I guess the long story is, um, to think about, I mean, the short answer is to just think about some initial things that you all can look into yourself, but also if you need to hire someone to do that for you, I think it's worth the money um, because that's the question that I asked myself about George Santos. Why did nobody just look into that? But it happens. Um, so I have to move on just in the interest of time, but I'm gonna try to hold a little bit of time at the end to address any more questions that come on. So let's talk about where to find strong candidates. So candidate recruitment is a long-term organic process. And as a local leader, you need to put out feelers throughout your network. This means reaching out to other local democratic organizations, union officials, um, folks you know on boards and charities, the local PTA, people you meet at protests. Really, um, I think the one thing that 
we should be thinking about with networking and looking for candidates, especially in areas where you feel like everybody you've talked to already has either run or has told you they're not interested in running is really mind your personal network and also think a little bit outside the box. Um, But you also want to just talk to folks that you see show up at events that you um, have seen volunteer in the community. This, This is just a sample of the avenues to find strong candidates. You also want to Rolodex yourself. Now, reach out beyond the usual political circles. Think about contacts within your social circle, houses of worship, and more. Make sure your candidate recruitment is an open and inclusive process. Asking for input and ideas from a broad range of people is not only the right thing, it increases your chances of recruiting a good candidate and strengthens your organization. I think what's important about this too is sometimes people have a certain, whereas I mentioned candidates can have a idea of what they think a candidate can look like. We can also do ourselves a disservice of having a very specific idea of what we think this candidate needs to be. No, again, focus on the values, focus on the value alignment, the work that you see people doing and how you think that they will be able to show up as a strong candidate. Um, That will also make sure that you continue to be open and inclusive. And like I said, think outside of the box a little bit when it comes to candidates running for office. It might not be the, the usual suspects that are the best candidates to step up and run. So I just stopped for questions. So I'm gonna keep moving along just so we can finish out. Candidate recruitment timeline. So we have an array of learners with us. So this is just some ballpark deadlines for when a candidate should have decided to run and fundraising should begin. Um, There may be months or just a few weeks before an area's filing deadline. So these are just like ballpark estimates of what you should be thinking about and how long of a runway you should be building to have time to recruit candidates. Um, And I actually think that these are pretty on par Um, And again, these are by the time that folks should have decided to run. So you're also knowing that if you know someone should have decided to run and should be preparing to launch a campaign around this timeline, then you have would have needed to start asking and building your recruitment goals a lot further out from this. And also recruitment should be something that is just being done all the time. You should always be... um, thinking of people and leaders in your organizations and your communities who could be candidates down the line. Um, Recruitment doesn't just have to come up when an actual election is, you know, about to come up because it just won't work in your favor. So what impacts the timeline? So expanding a little bit on the last slide, these are the main three factors. The office that's being run for, of course, the filing deadlines in an area, and also the voter universe for the race, because sometimes it's just going to take a lot longer to talk to people and the runway is just going to have to be much longer to be able to have an effective campaign. So it depends on the office. Now, while there are factors that impact a candidate's recruitment timeline, the biggest thing to consider is what the office is. Each campaign has finite resources, finite time, money, and people. So depending on the voter universe for the race in question, you and the candidate will need more or less of these resources. So for example, looking at fundraising data, anyone running for house or statewide office in 2022 should have made that decision by the first week of July 2021. This is despite the fact that 49 states filing windows for a 2022 cycle hadn't closed yet. But again, we're thinking about how far ahead do we need to plan to be able to ensure that the candidate has time to fundraise well and also run a strong campaign. So as local leaders looking to recruit, we need to be thinking further out. Um, We need to be thinking years out a lot of times, depending on the community that you're in. But having knowing that it takes time and knowing that there's a window that you need to be able to have a candidate ready will also help you set candidates up for success. Of course, filing deadlines. Ballot access requirements vary by state and so do filing deadlines. Um, For the 2022 cycle, the earliest deadline for the ballot 
access for ballot access was December 13th, 2021. I know in Illinois, we have super early um, ballot deadlines and some of your, and again, it varies by state, but having an idea of that is crucially important because there are sometimes petitions that need to be signed or a whole process that needs to happen before someone is ready to file for office. So then you also need to build in time to be able to recruit someone and also have them prepared to file by the filing deadline. Now um, you have to look at the voter universe as another factor of building out that timeline. Decision day, the day the candidate officially decides to run should be at the bare minimum the filing deadline minus three months for any office. Then you want to expand that preparation time as the size of the voter universe increases. So understanding the voter universe of a race is incredibly important in a future candidate's success because you're going to, if if they're running for a statewide race, you know that there's a lot of people they're going to have to talk to. So you need to expand that time a little bit more because you're going to have to give them time to be able to build out a campaign. It's not just about filing. Larger races, as I mentioned, just need more time. So for federal and statewide races and even expansive races um, in big cities like L.A. or Chicago or New York, you're going to have to build out a little bit more time for candidate recruitment because the campaign is just going to start a lot earlier. For smaller races, um, noting the filing deadline is going to be really important. So we want a candidate to make a decision at least three months before an area's filing deadline in smaller races. Um, For example, um, it's possible for, say, the Humboldt County Dems in Nevada to find a state Senate candidate in January, three months out from the March 18th filing deadline. But in Texas and Bexar County, um, their filing deadlines in Dece- is December 13th of the year before. So they need to find a candidate three months more of that, and they're going to have to spend their time recruiting and researching. So again, it'll just depend on, it's not just the office. Sometimes it just depends on how many people are in the voting universe as well. So this, um, this might, I know I've thrown out a lot of information, so I want to make sure that you all have some resources of some things that I mentioned as well. Um, so NDCC has compiled a list of campaign startup resources for the state and for your candidates to use. Um, that kind of goes along with thinking about the timeline and being able to give people the resources they need to be able to. Oh, thank you for um, correcting my pronunciation, Jeff. I just saw that. <laughs> Bear County. Um, And so here's some of those resources that I believe Bridget just dropped. So I now have seen that a lot of questions have come in, but um, we're at the end of our presentation, so I can start taking some of those. There was a question, which I think we went over, was when do you introduce your candidate? So even if you found a candidate and we went over that timeline, when uh, when do you start getting them out into into the community as a candidate? I think even if, for instance, the campaign hasn't been isn't ready to actually like publicly announce that they're running, it is never too early to start having a candidate um, build, honestly, build clout in the community. So whether that is um, accompanying a candidate to certain board meetings that they need to be attending so that people can start getting used to seeing them there, hearing them, you know, making sure that they're interacting with certain um, community organizations. I don't think there's ever too, an ever time too early for that. And I think an example of that might look like you might know someone that you think will be excellent to run for office and they have the qualities of the compelling story, the compelling narrative, but you just know that there's people they need to meet um, to be able to build the connections they need, not only for fundraising, but also for endorsements down the line. I actually don't think it's too early to start taking people around. It might to the to this question particularly if you are not ready to or if the candidate for instance is not ready to declare that they're running or for whatever reason cuz sometimes there is some strategy in not necessarily letting people know how who's running in a certain span of time 
that's totally understandable, but I still think the FaceTime is really important um, because when they do get ready to announce their race, people will remember, hey, they started coming to our, our organization's meetings two years ago and they have been coming regularly since then. And I actually really feel comfortable with knowing that they take these issues seriously and I've seen them do the work. It just makes them a stronger candidate, even if they weren't being introduced as the candidate for so-and-so office. Incredible point. Um, I mean, I think what it comes down to and what you're saying is people just have to show up. You got to do the work. You got to you got to get make it so that the community knows who you are. Um, we have also um, dropped a lot of different resources in the Slack about suggested online courses that you either want to share with candidates or you might want to take yourself to be able to support the discussion we had today. Um, some of those, Bridget, also just dropped in the chat as well. Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation today. I hope you learned a lot. Um, and as someone who works with candidates all the time, please, please, please recruit wonderful candidates. We, as you all know, we still don't have enough candidates to run for all the offices that we have. I saw someone mention something about local offices, and that's definitely a place where we need more candidates to run. So continue to do this work. Your work is vitally important for organizations like Run for Something and also to your communities in general. So thank you so much for joining. So you've identified a strong candidate for office, but how do you actually get them to run? Our next training focuses on how to recruit and persuade candidates to run. In it, you'll learn persuasion strategies and how to build support systems for new candidates. And for more training, take one of our free self-guided online courses linked in the description below. Thanks for training with us today.